वसुदेवसुत कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकनंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु So we are studying the Bhagavad Gita, and we are on the tenth chapter. Um, so last time we just started the tenth chapter, and we went through the first three verses. What's going on here is this: this. Um, by now, you must be tired of hearing this. The whole of the Bhagavad Gita can be seen in. You know, can divide it into three parts can be that's one way of looking at it uh, six chapters first six chapters then six more chapters and the final six chapters 18 chapters six chapters each three parts and the three parts are supposed to correspond to the mahavakya tatvam asi you are that which is the teaching of advaita vedanta that you are that absolute reality tatvam asi the first six chapters are they talk about our real nature who am i what am i the second six, six chapters they talk about god the creator preserver destroyer of this universe the god of religion the theistic god and the last six chapters are supposed to in this scheme tell us about the identity of the individual and the cosmic of you and god So actually, when when the Upanishad says "tattva masi," you are that. What, you stand for you, just this person, sentient being, and that, technically, that stands for God. Now, before you, you can wipe that big grin off your face. Oh, I am God. <laughs> not in that sense. Not in the sense of you know, I, this ego, this person, I am God. That's just megalomania, but. Um, in the sense that my own reality and god's reality is one reality it's one pure consciousness one swami put it very beautifully if you interrogate this world what is it really and the world will say i am actually brahman if you interrogate the in- individual being you i what are you really at least when we are enlightened we'll say i am brahman and if you interrogate god what's your reality what's the deepest mystery the answer to that god will say i am brahman so there is one underlying reality which appears as the world as us these individual beings and as a god which rules this universe uh, so in sanskrit jiva jagat ishvara jiva sentient beings jagat this world ishvara the god of this world you know god of religion all three are really one unlimited non dual existence consciousness place this second six chapters from chapter number 7 to chapter number 12 is about god is about that ishwar the god of religion and being about god it is very devotional so you will find a lot of bhakti teachings in these chapters what that what's what's going on now and um the way god is understood in all the religions which believe in god they are called theistic religions and someone might think are there religions which don't believe in god how can you have a religion without god well buddhism is such a religion jainism is another such religion in india it's well understood there may be two different ways of being religious one is the god the well known god way of being religion the other one is self enquiry based the inward looking way um the sankhyas the most ancient in hindu philosophers they were not theistic buddhists were not theistic jainas are not theistic um even the yoga patanjali yoga i'm saying this just i mean for people who don't know better it's all the same oh so he swami said the the patanjali yogi is not theistic but those who have studied indian philosophy will say mm, you're making a mistake there god is mentioned in patanjali yoga but that is not the god of uh in you know, the creator god now one way god is understood in all the theistic religions is that god is the creator of this universe to be god to be really god you must be the power behind this universe that which has created the universe that which is omnipotent omniscient omnipresent that that power 
That's how God is understood in all theistic religions, with variations in theology. Now, how does this God create this universe? There are these three levels of understanding. It's all relevant. I'm not going off on a wild goose chase. Um, one way is, there is a God, a power, which created this universe. Separate power, separate universe. In that case, you need to say something about that separate power. Where is that separate power? Then you have to imagine a separate realm called heaven, some kind of heaven, the Christian heaven or the you know, various kinds of Hindu heavens, Vaikuntha, Kailasha, Devi, Loka, whatever. And um, some material out of which this universe might have been created. So, for example, the ancient Nyaya philosophers and the Vaisheshika philosophers, they believed in God. But they believed God is this omnipotent, omniscient um, uh, power. But space is eternal. Space coexists with God. And there are eternal free-floating atoms in space. And what God does is, how does he create this universe? God creates this universe out of those free-floating atoms by the will of God. These atoms coalesce into stars and planets and the different worlds are formed. If you think about it from a modern cosmological perspective, they are pretty intuitive. Thousands of years ago, not too bad really. They didn't do too badly. However, notice in that conception, God and the material out of which this universe is created are separate. It's like a, you know, the model, the model probably they had in mind was a, um, a potter making pottery out of clay. So there is some clay and there is the makes pottery. But the potter and potter is what is called the intelligent cause, the intelligence behind this creation. So God is the intelligence, the power, but creation is made out of some other stuff which is not God stuff. A deeper understanding came. This is stage one, a separate God. A deeper understanding came that if God is truly God, all that there is, then the universe cannot be literally separate from God. You can't really say God created the universe and then, then say that uh, there were atoms before creation, there was space before creation, there was time. When you're saying before, already time. So that means God didn't create time. God didn't create space. God didn't create the, the atoms or the particles. A more comprehensive God would be that God existed and that was there was only God and nothing else before creation. In that case, whatever we call creation, this universe, must have come out of God, out of God stuff. So the deeper understanding of, of God um, and creation, in Sanskrit this is called Parinamavada, transformation theory. So God projects this universe or creates it out of his, her, its own being. So what is this universe made of? It's literally made of God. So that is the second or deeper understanding. Uh, it is God transforms in some theories part of its being, some theories um, its power. So there are multiple theories. There are all various uh, forms of what is called Parinamavad, the theory, the causality which believes in transformation of cause into effect. What's the cause? God. What's the effect? Universe. You can see how is this different from the first theory, where God and the material are different. And then there can be a deeper understanding, which is the Advaita, which we claim to be deeper, is that does, is it possible for an absolute reality, for pure being or pure consciousness, to transform itself, limit itself, you know, can the infinite become the finite, can the changeless actually change or is God, and not, not only that, if God has changed in some way into this universe, God is changeful then. If, so you might say, what's, what's the harm? There are many problems. A changeful God is subject to change and decay and eventual death. Why not? If, change, if you're admitting change, why not the ultimate change of death and destruction? So God would die. And um, God changes. If God is perfect. Look at, I'm giving you some problems which, which come if you say that God really changes. If God changes, God is our idea of God in every religion. is God is perfect. And whatever your idea of perfection, but God has to be per perfect. The most perfect being. 
if the most perfect being changes in any way, the change state will be less than perfect. To put it in less philosophical terms, it means God will really become miserable, God will really become sinful, God will really become you know, damaged. And, uh, in other words, not quite godly anymore. So there are many problems if you admit a tra changing, transformed God. And if you just say God has been transformed into this universe, then it's not God anymore, it's just the universe. It's just the universe. If it's really tables and chairs and that's it. God, it was God maybe once at a, upon a time, but no longer. It's just the universe. Um, that's the problem with the theory called pantheism. Spinoza uh, you know, talks about this entire God being this entire universe. But critics will say that if you literally say this is God, then you're just using a new term for the universe. Why not just call it the universe? Why not just call a table a table? Why, why are you saying that it's God who became a table or God somehow is a table? If it's really a table, then that's all it is. Call it a table. Call it a world. Call it matter and energy, time and space. Why are you calling it God? Anymore? What, what's godly about it anymore? So not pantheism. The deeper understanding is God, Brahman, the ultimate reality, remaining exactly as it is, perfect, appears as this universe. So this universe, the, the famous two theories of truth, the ultimate truth and the relative truth. In the relative truth, like a movie, it could be a comedy, it could be a tragedy, the perfection of the movie screen is not marred in any way. Many examples are given, like a mirage, the water in the desert. So Shankaracharya famously says, all the water in a mirage is not enough to wet one grain of sand of the desert. So all the universe is appearing and all the terrible things happening in the universe is not enough to mar even in the least the perfection of God. So that is the Advaitic idea of, they call it Vivartavada, not an actual transformation of God into the universe, not an actual transformation of the cause into the effect, but the cause appearing as the effect. Like your mind Remaining the mind, it appears as an entire world of dreams in your dreams. Like a movie screen. Remaining the movie screen can appear as all kinds of movies. So this is the third understanding. It is Brahman only. This universe is Brahman. Appearing as the universe. At our unenlightened, unenlightened uh, perspective, it appears like the world and that's it. We don't see any Brahman, God or anything here. The, and to the enlightened person, this here is God shining through in every person, in every activity, in every, you know, in the tiniest and in the most massive scale. It is none other than one existence consciousness place. That enlightened one is the one who interrogates the universe and the universe tells him or her, I am God. And looks inside and finds, I am God. And looks at God, God, obviously I am God. So that God which is the God of the universe, the individual and this cosmos, that is Brahman. What might be called in English the Godhead, the, the absolute being. And mystics in all religions have accessed that. Now why am I saying all this? What this chapter is doing is halfway in between. It's talking about God not as just as Krishna or as Vishnu in, the, in a particular heaven, but as God who has become, second stage, who has become this universe. So this universe is the glory of God. I mentioned earlier what one Advaitic teacher, master, uh, contemporary master told me, Pranav Chaitanya in Banaras. He said, how does the Gita regard this world, this world, the world we live in, in three ways? It takes three passes at this question. What is this world? First, I'll tell you the Sanskrit words he used and then I've already said this, well, quickly touch upon it. First pass, heya, to be given up. In Sanskrit, heya, to be given up. Discarded. Renounced. Second pass, divya, divine. This world. Third pass at it. What is this world? Brahman, the ultimate reality. What does it mean, heya, to be given up? Why heya, to be given up? The worldly approach to this world is, this is all that there is, this is the reality and we are trying to grasp hold of it and we suffer and suffer and suffer. There's something terribly wrong here. There's something terribly wrong. He said, um, 
Why? Because of enormous suffering present here. Most of us will say, we are not really suffering, but dissatisfied. Everybody is dissatisfied. You know, existential angst, if everything is going well for you, well, congratulations, but it won't last. It's too good to last. <laughs> so we are dissatisfied. So because of enormous suffering, and if you, if you think that's not true, wait. Somebody wrote a comment to me that, uh, you know, we say Vedanta, the purpose of Vedanta is to overcome suffering and attain bliss. Overcome suffering. Uh, Buddha also says the problem is suffering and how do you overcome suffering. But my 13-year-old daughter told me, we accept happiness happily. And so suffering also comes in this world. We should accept suffering also. I did not have any answer to that. What would be the answer to that? Why even try to overcome suffering? I said the answer to that is she's 13 years old. (laughs) <laughs> she hasn't and thank God may she never ex- experience suffering but she has not experienced suffering don't take it too literally don't take it too seriously either I'm sorry to say but uh, you know in this world not just here in the United States but also in India and everywhere we're fast becoming the more we advance we're fast becoming you know, like a child worshipping civilization Whatever children say is, is uh, the words of wisdom. I know moms and dads love children. That's great. Uh, but don't be immature. Uh, children might once upon a, uh, uh, you know, once in a while say something that's pretty wise. That doesn't mean they are wise. No. <laughs> you give them a halo of wisdom because you love your kids. Uh, worse. Um, one gentleman with a heartfelt, he said, I'm learning so many spiritual lessons just watching my dog. <laughs> I was, I didn't say anything. I rolled my eyes a little bit. Here you are, you're sitting with a monk. Uh, here you are, today you are, you have the spiritual heritage of the combined, you know, spiritual heritage of all of humanity, all the religions religions, the thought of all the philosophers available to you. God is available to you. No, it has to be from the dog. <laughs> no, don't do that. So, the f- first thing is, here, the world is to be given up because of suffering. Um, the Gita says, Prapya imam asukham lokam, this world full of suffering, having attained, having come here. Second, anityam, it is Anityam means impermanent, continuously changing. I told you what's wrong with change. When say change is not bad. Yes, but change is the problem with change is we want to have fulfillment, happiness, and that depends upon so many factors. And if you ever are lucky enough to get all the factors at their optimum level, you know, wealth and health and Facebook likes and the proper parking, and all of that goes very well for you because it's a changing set, all the time changing. Next moment, it will change. And it, the level will be suboptimal. So we are programmed for suffering. Unfortunately, that was the Buddha's great discovery. Yeah. Fun guy, 2,500 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> but no, uh, he's a fun guy because not, he tells us the truth about the way the world is, but he also tells us a way out, uh, you know, how to attain, how to go beyond suffering, he says. So it is dukkha, suffering. It is anitya, temporary. Whatever, any gains you make here, prosperity, family, wealth, and, uh, you know, learning, civilizational advance, all of it is temporary. There's an ancient saying uh, you know, in India, a thousand years of city, a thousand years of forest. We go to the Hayden Planetarium here, we saw this show. What was here of millions of years ago? Right here, right here, where we are sitting. It was underwater, and there were these huge, extinct uh, di- uh, under, you know, sea dinosaurs, which were swimming around here. That's what it was, right here. A thousand years a city, a thousand years a forest. And then, a thousand years a city again. So, temporary. And then the uh, Gita goes further. Maya. It's not just temporary, it's an appearance. It's not even real in itself. It's not that it doesn't exist, but it's not the way we think it is. 
It's an appearance. Something deeper is there. We are just seeing the surface of it. Maya. Where does the Gita say it's Maya? Um, second chapter, 16th verse. Nasato vidyate bhava. I will not explain that. But it's a big thing. So that's the first thing about you know, to know about this world. It's not a good place. The world which we inhabit. The world which the way we look at it. The second thing which we know about this world, which this is this chapter deals with. This tenth chapter famously will deal with it. It's a wonderful place. Seems to be just the opposite of what we said. You give up the world as the world, and then you see the divinity in this world. It becomes a wonderful place. The word used was divya, divine. Literally, the Sanskrit div comes to from to shine. Devata, the gods, the shine. Divya means divine. This world is the glory of, of God. If you see it as that. Not as things to be grabbed and things to be avoided. But it's glory of God. And that's what the 10th chapter is about. So it's sort of intermediate. But it goes further. Which has not been mentioned in this chapter. It will come later in the, from the 13th chapter onwards. It's not only the glory of God. It's the ultimate reality itself. When I say the... Be careful. Advaita Vedanta, this is like anathema to say that the world is the ultimate reality itself. Not in that sense. It's the ultimate reality itself. It's not the world. That's the meaning of Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya Jiva Brahma Napara. Brahman alone is real. The world is an appearance. And you are none other than Brahman. That's a relief. Because thinking, what am I? Am I real or false? An appearance or... Don't worry. You are the reality. And this world which includes body, mind, individuality, they are appearances. So, the 10th chapter will introduce us to that in-between stage, where God says, I have created this universe, out of what? Out of myself. So, all this universe must be in some sense God. And then Krishna will introduce you to how do you see God in everything in this universe. He will point out some places where God is most manifest, Easier to see. Most manifest means more easier to see. And um, as a part of our spiritual practice. So we'll, when we interact with the world, it will no longer be, this is worldly and that's spiritual. In the church and the temple and the Vedanta society, oh, that's spiritual. In Wall Street or in Broadway, oh, that's secular. No, everywhere the same God shines through. That's what the theme of this chapter is. Now, in the... Um, fourth and fifth verses which we'll see together Krishna is saying our internal universe thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, intelligence all of that, that's also God it's like we identify those as my thoughts and feelings and I'm looking out, alright this world is you're saying this is not a world, this is God but I am experiencing that as a world or as God. But no, that which you think you're experiencing, your own thoughts, your emotions, your aspirations, your intelligence and knowledge, your joys and sorrows, all of that is also none other than that one divinity. So that's what's said in the fourth and fifth universe. Our internal universe is also God. Let's do fourth and fifth together. Buddhir jnanam asam moha Buddhir jnanam asam moha Kshama satyam dama kshama Kshama satyam dama kshama Sukham dukham bhavo bhavo Sukham dukham bhavo bhavo Bhayam cha bhayam eva cha Cha bhayam eva cha Ahim sa samata tushti Ahim sa samata tushti Tapo danam yasho yasha Tapo danam yasho yasha Bhavanti bhava bhutanam Bhavanti bhava bhutanam Matta eva prithag vidha Matta eva prithag vidha Discrimination, knowledge, non-delusion, forgiveness, truthfulness, self-control, tranquility, happiness, misery, existence, non-existence, fear and also fearlessness, non-injury, equanimity, contentment, austerity, charity, fame, ill-fame. These different dispositions of beings are indeed born of me. 
we'll just run through the list. But it just means whatever we feel inside, whatever we think inside, whatever we experience within ourselves, first person experience, all of them come from God. The beauty of it is, when we begin to see that, we get what is called an even-sightedness, an even-mindedness. That this is great and the rest of it is awful. That kind of reaction becomes less and less. We begin to see, this is not particularly great and that's not so bad either. We begin to see all of them are coming from the Lord and all of them I accept with respect and with equanimity. All of them remind me of the Lord. That, that's a wonderful thing. Whatever happens in my mind. See, we are most impacted by not so much by the world, not so much by other people. We're impacted by our reactions to the world and other people. All those reactions are also divine, not in the sense that they're great. They're divine because they're coming from the divine. And if you take the transformation theory, the second theory we talked about, then it is the divine. If it's a transform, if it's clay, then the clay pot, the pot must be clay. If it is a golden ornament, then a necklace and the bracelet and the you know whatever it is, a tiara, it must be gold. Okay. Now uh, he, I'm using a particular commentary, but. Don't worry about it. There are multiple commentaries. The one I'm using is by Sridhar Swami. A simple commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. So, buddhi. First he says buddhi. Buddhi literally means intellect. But here he uh, specifically says, I'll give you the Sanskrit translations, the interpretations he has given. What is intellect? Sara, sara, viveka, naipurnyam. The ability to grasp in all things in life, but especially in spiritual life, to grasp the essence and leave out the non-essential. Vivekananda used to say, I am a man in a hurry. We are all people in a hurry actually. We don't just know it. Time is running out, the clock is ticking. Good deal of our life is already gone in being, just being young. <laughs> being 13. But, and then there will come a time in, uh, in our lives, you know, when our age catches up with us and the physical, the debilitating and difficult to change. So make the best use of it, whatever time we have. Um, so the ability to take the essence of a scripture, of a talk, of an idea and to put it to practice, and to, to assimilate it, to make it part of my being, not just a little bit of information. But a part of my being. That he says, this is the real nature of buddhi, intellect. Quite different from, we think intelligent means a person who is very scholarly, who read a lot of books and knows lots of things. No, he says the ability to take the sense out of it. Sometimes people who are not scholarly, not with big degrees, they might have a lot of strong common sense. The ability to take, extract an essence. Now, then Knowledge. So from intellect comes knowledge. So he says, the next thing he says is knowledge, jnanam, knowledge. And then what is this knowledge? He says, jnanam, atma vishayam, the knowledge about yourself. This is vast universe out there. Yeah. Encyclopedias to read. He says, all of that, that's fine. What knowledge we are talking about here is, who am I? What am I? Atma vishayam, the jnanam. Jnanam means the knowledge about yourself. So he's making it very specific. This is the commentator, not Krishna himself, but the commentator. Then he says, Asam moha. Moha means delusion. We are walking around in a fog. We are not totally awake. Some are totally asleep. <laughs> That's the, like, it's a kind of operating cost you have when you have a Vedanta class. Some will be sleeping. But you expect some to be awake and most people to be halfway in between, half and half, you know. That's the meaning of the term Buddha, the one who woke up. So, asam, moha means delusion. We are walking around in a fog, we don't even know what the world which we inhabit is. We are so much... Uh, bubbling with what is especially Raga Dvesha, likes and dislikes, our dispositions, our attitudes towards the world and people. That we continuously are interpreting the world. 
reading motives into people which are not there. That one really likes me and that one really hates me. Neither is true. I can assure you that without knowing who you are and which is the, who is the one who likes you and who hates you. Neither is true. Very few people can be bothered with, uh, with our, anybody else. Yeah. It's a basic operating principle. Yeah. So, we walk around in a fog. Imputing motives to people. Uh, uh, scared of uh, phantoms in, uh, in this world. You know, walking around in anxiety. Somebody said we are all, you know, those old slapstick comedy movies, Charlie Chaplin, you see somebody slipping and falling in a banana peel. But we are always slipping and falling in a banana peel. Either we're slipping and falling back into the past, memories, regrets, or you know, golden, uh, it was so nice when we were young, back. Or we're slipping forward and falling into the future, anxiety, expectation, not even here. So we are walking around in a fog, that's the delusion, moha. To be enlightened at the minimum is to snap out of it. The Buddha, when uh, the beautiful story, Houston Smith in his book, Religions of the World, he introduces the chapter on Buddhism in this way. After enlightenment, the Buddha is walking before he gives his first teaching. And a shepherd boy sees him and is struck by the extraordinary exp uh, ex uh, expression on his face, the radiance of this person, this being. And he says, what are you? Houston Smith writes there. Many people have been asked, who are you? We all ask, who are you? What are you? Yeah. Either somebody is tremendously evil. You can ask a Hitler, what are you? <laughs> or something extraordinarily good, more than good, divine. So what are you? What are you? Are you a god? And Buddha said, no. Are you an angel? In the, in the Sanskrit would have been Devadut, you know, like a messenger of the gods. No. Are you a human being? No. Then he's bewildered. Then what are you? He said, I am Buddha, the awakened. I have woken up. So, moha. What happens if you have intelligence and with intelligence you have extracted the knowledge about the self? You have woken up. Asam moha, completely undiluted about yourself and this world. And all other qualities. Kshama. Kshama means sahishnutva. Ability to forbear the behavior of others, the um, you know, illness, a kind of toughness, mental toughness, fortitude, um, ability, ups and downs in life. I've seen through many things in life, I shall also see this through, just that attitude. The psychologist Albert Bandura called it self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a kind of feeling that I can deal with most things in my life. That kind of confidence. He was talking about students, uh, school and college students. Now, what does Kshama forgiveness have to do with it? Um, this spiritual, this toughness, also the ability to forgive other people for their actual or imagined wrongs which I, they have done. Remember, again, very shocking, they are mostly forgotten. If they have done wrongs to you, they have forgotten about it. They really do not, uh, most people don't hold ill will against you. They don't even remember that they uh, did something. We remember because it's the party which has been hurt which remembers. But it's no good storing up hurts. No good. So the ability to forgive and let go. To forgive and let go. And move ahead in life. Um, that doesn't mean you allow people to take advantage of you. There is Sri Ramakrishna's story of the hiss. It's important to know. You, you don't hiss, but don't bite. So there was this, uh, uh, I'll tell you this parable. A brahmachari, a, a, you know, a, a celibate monk who was going from village to village and he comes to the particular village and he's going on a particular path. And the villagers say, don't go that way. There's a venomous snake, a big cobra, which stays there. It'll bite you. And the uh, brahmachari, the, the wandering monk, he said, no, I know the mantras, you know, they can't do anything to me. And then the snake comes out charging at him and the brahmachari quite didn't sit down with his mantra and then he says, why are you so violent? Why are you hurting people? Um, so the snake says, what should I do? And the brahmachari said, here is a mantra, repeat this mantra and you'll become enlightened and um, don't bite. Then he goes his way. 
Years later, he comes back to that same village. He's passing through that village and he says, wasn't there a snake here? Uh, and the people say, oh, it's dead. Uh, it can't die. It can't die before um, becoming uh, enlightened because I know the power of the mantra I gave it. Well, nobody has seen it for ages. Then the brahmachari goes and calls out to the snake and after some time sees his snakes become very skinny and it's sort of broken. It sort of painfully crawls out of its hole and comes and bows down to the... Um, bowing down is pretty easy if you're a snake. You just have to do this. Uh, to the brahmachari and the brahmachari said, How are you? I'm fine. I'm very happy. The mantra you gave me, it gives me a lot of peace. But what happened to you? You're hurt and broken. And, Ramajai, and the snake said, no, that's nothing. I had to think and said, oh, it's those mischievous children, you know. Once they realize that I'm not going to bite, they caught hold of me. One particularly mischievous boy caught hold of my tail and swung me around and dashed me on the ground. And But it's all right. They're children. It's all right. I've forgiven them. Um, then the brahmachari said, I told you not to bite. I didn't tell you not to hiss. So to hiss means make sure people don't take advantage of you. Until you are enlightened, until you have achieved the goal of your life. It's no good, I'm forgiving everybody, I'm practicing non-violence. And you're most disturbed and uh, unhappy because people keep troubling you. With the disturbed and unhappy and, and troubled mind, you can't do spiritual practice, you can't meditate. You can't study, you can't pray. So you have to protect yourself. Whether you have a worldly goal, you're raising a family, building a business, you have to protect yourself. If you are going to be spiritual, you have to protect yourself. Common sense always. So Kshama here, um, one interesting insight I found, Eknath Ishwaran, if you, I don't know if you have, some of you may have read his beautiful writings. He has three volumes on the Gita also. Uh, so one insight he gives is, look at the continuity. Buddhi is intellect. Um, and then through that intellect you know, you get knowledge, knowledge about the self. And through that knowledge about the self, your uh, delusion goes away, you wake up. One good way of driving away this fog is forgiveness, he says, kshama. Uh, this non-forgiveness generates a big fog, thick fog in our lives. Letting go, forgiving, uh, that internally. Out outwardly, if it's a nasty person, you may continue to hiss. But internally it's okay. And then Satyam, he goes on to um, describe each of them. Truth, Yathartha Bhashanam, speaking things as they are. So that's a simple definition of the truth. I think a couple of classes back I mentioned the French philosopher Michel Foucault. And his, uh, almost his last works were truth-telling on what is called in Greek pharesia, uh, which is telling truth which can be damaging to oneself. I mean, don't, you don't have to go around telling people. I'm, I'm going to you know, badger people on the street. I'm going to tell you some damaging truths about myself. <laughs> people do that now, not on the street, but on uh, social media, every all the time. No, but no. Um, general tendency is to hide and project what I am not. To be quite simple about it. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, it is the simple. In one's last life, one, one becomes a simple person. That's why if I'm simple, people will take advantage of me. The clever will take advantage of me. There's a saying, nothing confounds the clever so much as simplicity. <laughs> so, satyam, truth. Dhamma, dhamma means control of the senses. Kshama, control of the, shama means control of the mind, internals, the mind. Um, sukha and dukha, all the... Translations and commentary is very simple. Sukha is that which is pleasant. Dukkha is that which is unpleasant. So far we are discussing spiritual things inside. Knowledge, self-knowledge, removing the delusion. But also the experience of pain. Dukkha. Um, bhava, Udbhava. He says Bhava means birth, creation. Abhava is death. I am born. I come to a sense of my own existence, not only at physical birth, but also as I grow as a baby, you know, the whole development of the psychology. And then the degeneration, and then the stopping of the mind at death. All of that, he says. Uh, bhaya, bhaya means fear. Uh, abhaya, fearlessness. All of these, Krishna says, they all come from me. 
All of these come from me. So when these things come up in the mind, we must remember that this has come from God. There is a divine element in this. Just as much as, much as there is clay in pots and gold in golden ornaments, there is God in, there is that one Brahman in all of these things. Then ahimsa, non-violence. Here's a whole list here, non-violence, in thought, word and deed. Swami Ram Sukhdas Ji gives a list of 81 types of non-violence. But I'm not going to go through that list now. It'll be, it's a kind of violence to subject you to that. <laughs> it's the 82nd kind of violence. <laughs> then he says, Samata. This is a beautiful one. Samata means evenness. And um, the commentator here translates it as... Um, Mitra Mitra Tulyata Raga Desha Rahityam Transcending our conditioning, likes and dislikes, strong likes and dislikes for people and food and activities and places, uh, transcending it. How do you transcend it? If all of these things are coming from the same source, my beloved Lord alone is appearing or is, um, is giving me all of this. In that case, my focus is on God. Not on the nasty thing somebody said to me or the great thing that I'm ex- expecting next. Not that. All of this is coming from the Lord. That's where my attention is. That evenness. Tushti. Daiva labdhena santosha. Another word is used is tushti. Tushti means um, contentment. So you put forth your best in the world. At the end of the day, go not harassed and harried to bed. Not like a hunted hare, you know, with the the hunting dogs are after you. No, go to bed with contentment because I have put in what I I could do and I give the whole thing, my efforts and whatever I've got, mentally I offer it at the feet of the Lord. And sleep happily. Tushti, fulfillment, contentment, as far as the world, material things are concerned. We are usually very contented about God and discontented about the world. Tushti means to be contented about the world and discontented. Why do I not have focus on God? Why, why, do, I not, why do I keep forgetting God? Why is it so difficult for me to you know, be even-minded about the world? Sri Ramakrishna was most discontented about God. He wept and wept and wept for what? For, for him God was the Divine Mother Kali. Why have I not been able to see you? One more day has passed. The sun is setting on the bank of the Ganges, on the Ganga. He would rub his face on the um, shore of the river till his face bled. And he would cry for the mother. And the people around him, they thought he's a young priest. He has come from a village. He's probably, he misses his mother. But he's, so he's, this is a divine discontent. And Sri Ramakrishna said, people cry, you know, they shed pots of tears. For their you know, wives, husbands, for their children, for money. Nobody cries for God. I choose to be mad about God. I, pr- I cry about God. So santosha means contentment about the world. Tapaha, austerities, dhanam. So they are very nice uh, translations here, but I will move ahead. Dhanam means giving. There are so many stories here. There is a very very ancient story. The gods, devatas, human beings and the demons, they all went to the to Brahma, their their grandsire, the creator of this universe. Not God, not Brahman, the ultimate reality, just Brahma, the god, who is sort of, sort of like a subcontractor. You You give him the job of making the universe. God gives him the job of making the universe. Anyway, so they all the people after the universe had been created, they all went to him for advice. Um, Tell us, what spiritual advice do you have for us? And see, there clearly Brahma gives different advice to the gods, different advice to human beings, different advice to the demons. What will make them progress? So, all he said, they prayed to Brahma, it's very dramatic. And Brahma replied in the voice of thunder. What did the thunder say? Da, da, da. Eliot, he used this. What did the thunder say? 
in the po- poem itself he's written da 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 but what does it mean three times da uh, first is for the gods it is damyatam control yourself the gods are is like super powered beings you know and uh, they are always having a party these are not spiritual beings they are gods with a small g uh, so they are all these radiant beautiful beings and always having a party um, control yourself for you spiritual pro- progress is possible when you control yourself damyatam control stop for human beings datta give because human beings are petty and small and close fisted it is godly to give it is great to be give don't be small sri ramakrishna advised the mother when he was dying of throat cancer he, his advice his parting advice to her is always never put your hand like this before anybody when i'm gone you be contented with your little village cottage and you know you have a vegetable garden and whatever you get in your little backyard garden you live on that don't ask always give so hand like this is asking hand like this is giving human beings the the uh, advice of brahma the grandsire of the universe grandfather of the universe is give learn to give so what about the demons he said dayadham be kind demons are cruel they 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 like hurting so these are the people who are good who are privileged who are have got everything in life but they are wasting their life in pleasure seeking they are the gods what is what is the way forward for them self control um there are people who are cruel in nature who like hurting others what is the way forward for them compassion and then the rest of us general advice to people is not to be small be big let go give they say there is a A prosperity psychology and a poverty psychology it doesn't depend on how much money somebody has is american story about the scrooge <laughs> so one can to give so that is the uh, answer here he says danam even that impulse to give krishna says it comes from god yasha fame ayasha loss of fame now it is very fast facebook likes up and down <laughs> twitter followers up and down so all of that remember it comes from it comes from twitter no it comes from god <laughs> <laughs> moving on so our entire internal internal universe you have to see god in all of that that's the basic message number 6 same theme everything in this universe i have become that's the theme so that you see me in this universe in everything sixth maharshaya sapta purve maharshaya sapta purve chatvaro manavas tatha chatvaro manavas tatha madbhava manasa jata madbhava manasa jata yesham loka imah praja yesham loka imah praja the seven great sages the earlier four and also the manus were born of my mind endowed with my essence whose progeny are these in the world so very poetic stuff here so brahma the creator uh, created first the so his job was to create the universe so his first attempt was didn't work this story is very nice you know we ask why if god created the world why did god cre- why didn't god create a perfect world why such an awful world so god did try he tried to create a perfect world didn't work so there's one version of the story that he created these four sages is misbe mentioned here and he expected the, the, the sages means they were not uh, human beings they were very wise beings they had all spiritual knowledge and everything and the expectation was they will take this universe forward you know, they will have uh, progeny and they will they will have families and uh, create worlds and civilizations and all. but no when these sages came into being how did they come into being manasa he says they came from my mind god says from my mind or from brahma's mind 
it is said sankalpa just as just by thought so how can you create anything by thought actually you create any, everything is created by thought basically and every day in the night in our dreams we create universes with thoughts uh, a painter uh, well or a novelist a scientist it creates by thought anyhow so there is this concept of manasa putra a child born of mind not physical child child born of mind in fact in our tradition sri ramakrishna had that relation with swami brahmananda that the divine mother appeared before him in a vision and said um, here is a baby and he, in a vision he, she put this baby on his lap and he said i am a, a celibate how am i going to have a child and she said this is not not a child in that way this is your manasa putri your spiritual son but literally it means mind born so brahma created the mind born the first four sages but it flopped because the first four sages were such perfect beings the moment they saw what's this a universe why we were perfectly happy absorbed in the ultimate reality in brahman in god and so let's they immediately sat down to meditate and attain nirvana immediately and disappeared <laughs> this is one version of the story so what brahma said it just didn't work it didn't work satvik they were all very satvik so now let me create a universe with a proper mixture of not just you know sugar and spice all of it together sweet and sour all of it together so sattva rajas tamas the divine qualities the dynamic qualities but also the awful qualities all of it together and the next batch he created they were, that was successful they had all sorts of different dispositions and the universe is humming along nicely till now you, you can see it's all around us so anyway uh, but the original story is that brahma first created four sages this is what is called the four earlier the seven great sages they are very famous in uh, hindu mythology in hindu thought but the, before the seven there were the four and these are the four and they are all immortal so these four are still there they are called um, sanak sanandan sanatana sanat kumar so these are the four names and often they are just referred to as sanakaadi sanaka etc so in many hymns many songs uh, they are referred to as the great sages so they are supposed to be still there and they are all uh, teaching uh, humanity they're giving spiritual knowledge to humanity in fact if you have heard of theosophy so theosophy was based on um, oriental wisdom uh, indian wisdom hin- basically hindu buddhist and jain thought in theosophy they have a system of what they call mahatmas so this invis- invisible spiritual beings which give knowledge to you and also all sorts of theories there but the point i want to make here is the greatest of these mahatmas in the- in theosophy thought theosophy is still big in america it's still there there are um, uh, centers so the greatest of these spiritual beings who give um, spiritual knowledge to humanity from age to age this immortal spiritual being his name is wait for it sanat kumar the fourth of these four great sages if you look up theosophy their theories and all so there is a mystical city which is in the sky somewhere over mongolia in the gobi desert it's called shambhala which is the again taken from buddhist thought the buddhist uh, spiritual city and there dwell all spiritual beings and at the head of them is one this immortal luminous being who happens to be called this sanat kumar the ancient uh, the fourth of the four ancient sages but they didn't do much for creating a world so brahma tried again then he created the seven great sages who are known as the saptarshi and um, after that he created what is called the manus so manus are the um, the let us say the creators of civilization so they are supposed to be 14 manus and each manu has a period of civilization running for hundreds of thousands of years so this is a whole calculation um, right now we are in the age of the seventh manu the first manu was supposed to be swayambhuva and the seventh manu that's the one who is behind our present civilization for as long as we can look back you know from pre civilization uh, era till now the seventh manu's name is vaivasvata manu so this is all in indian cosmology there are seven more manus to come after this till the, the end of this universe anyway not our point here madbhava manasa jata they are born of my mind 
Yeshan Loka Imah Praja Imah Prajaha. And this world that you see around, they're all descended from these Manus. And um, that's where the name um, Manusha in, in Sanskrit means human being. It's come from Manu. Even the word English word man, I don't know if you look at the root, I don't know where it has come from. It might be connected to the Sanskrit Manu. Man, Manu also is related to the Sanskrit word for mind, a thinking being. Anyhow, all that is not the point. All of this, which is this vast and most ancient cosmology, Krishna says, from God, all of these things have come. That's the point. All right. I will not go into the next few verses, which are very soaring and very sublime. He says, those who know this, they will realize the truth about what I am, what this universe is, and they'll become enlightened. He's going to say that. And how do you practice this? All of this will come next. I'll just let it be. Uh, we can take up questions, observations, comments. If you raise your hand, yes. Tell us your name and ask the question. Okay. <laughs> this is a question for the big guy. <laughs> Why did he have to... I can give you multiple answers. None of them very good. Let me warn you at the beginning. Um... Why did God have to create this universe? One answer in Vedanta is for us. What do you mean for us? We are spiritually evolving. So we need a field of action. We need a universe, we need bodies, we need to interact and grow spiritually until we become enlightened. And I know you can always say that, so how did it start? Why are we unenlightened to begin with? Why were we created? We were not created. And according to Vedanta, there are multiple theories. One is that the souls, our the Atman, the selves, they are co-evil with God. They exist along with God. God didn't create us. Or, even deeper answer is, you and God are actually one reality. One answer to this is a beautiful story which Alan Watts has told. I love this story. It's for, it seems like it's for children, but it's really I mean, for, for grown-ups actually. So he says, in the beginning there was nothing. No universe. God alone existed. Why did God exist? A particularly obstinate child can ask. <laughs> but God can't help existing. There's something called a necessary existence. So God, ex God is existence itself. God cannot not exist. So God existed from eternity to eternity. But eternity is an awfully long time. Awfully, awfully long time. So God got bored. And God wanted to play. But there was nobody to play with. It was only God existed. Nothing to play with. Nobody to play with. Then God thought about it. How can this problem be solved? And because God is awfully smart, he came up with a, he, she, it, came up with a solution. Uh, what was the solution? God decided to be not God. So I'm God. If there's anything else, that must be not God. So God and now not God. Now there are two. They can play. And so God was very happy. He could play with not God. But the problem is now that God is not only very clever, God is awfully good at what he does. So when he decided to play not God, he completely forgot that he was God. <laughs> and now not God is searching for who am I, what am I, what's going on? <laughs> and that's this universe. That's what you are. <laughs> so that's the, it's actually the, based on Kashmiri Shaivism. Kashmiri Shaivism says this. Sri Ramakrishna said, um, Pash Baddha Jeeb, Pash Mukta Sheeb. In bondage, the same reality is Jeeva, sentient being. Freed from bondage, the same reality is Shiva, the ultimate reality. That's one answer. Why did God create? Because he was bored, he wanted to play. And there's the whole Leela theory behind it. A deeper answer is, why did God create? Answer is, no, he didn't. Didn't. You're asking the rope, why did you create a snake? The rope snake example, the rope, what will the rope say? I didn't, it's your mistake. God is perfectly God. There is no, it didn't create anything at all. Then what's all this, you'll say, but the, what an awful answer. What is all this then? It's an appearance. God didn't do anything. It's like watching a horror movie uh, on a, uh, in a movie hall and then complaining to the movie screen. Why are you so horrible? No, the screen didn't do anything. It just provided the occasion for you to enjoy the movie. So God did not actually create. Creating means making something new. It didn't. 
God's appearing in this way. That's one answer. God didn't create. That's what, what uh, this is talking about. This universe itself is nothing other than God. I'm using God as a general term. There are more precisely Saguna Brahman, Brahman with attributes. That's what's being talking, talked about here. Um, there also you can push it forward, further. You can ask this question, but why did God appear as this universe? All, all right, I accept it. God didn't create. But why did God appear as this universe? You know, this God didn't create. It's an appearance. In some of the, uh, you know, the scriptures, if you look at it from this perspective, they suddenly make extraordinary sense. Uh, the Quran, the source of Islam, the first verse in the Quran says that Allah is not born, nor does Allah, uh, Allah is not born, nor does He give birth. So the ultimate reality is not created out of anything, nor does that ultimate reality create anything. Of course, theologians give it a different spin, but if you look at it literally, it's saying that means if. God was not created from anything and God does not create anything, then whatever is, is God. Then you can pro process it further, you can push it further. You say, well, if God, all right, God is appearing, Brahman is appearing as this world, why appear at all? Somerset Maugham, the f English author, novelist, he read quite a bit of uh, Vedanta and he went and met uh, Ramana Maharshi in India. So in one of his essays he writes, when he hears about God, you know, Brahman projecting this universe, his wry British humor, you know, he writes, uh, one feels that Brahman could have left well enough alone. <laughs> Shouldn't have created or projected this universe. Would have spared us a lot of trouble. So you might ask, why? All right, I understand it's Maya, it's a projection, it's an appearance, it's lower truth, all of that, fine. But even that I can ask, why? Now, one answer, I have come, I have multiple answers here. One answer I'll share with you and stop. This is getting very up, awfully abstract. One answer is, you're asking why is Brahman appearing as this universe? And why is the absolute reality appearing as this relatively reality? Or simply, why is God appearing as this world? Tell me, what option does God have? Either to appear or not to appear. And God does both. When the universe is existing, this is God appearing to you as this universe. When the universe does not exist, according to Hindu cosmology, there are times called pralaya, cosmic dissolution, where God alone exists, no universe. God is not appearing as anything at all. Then God has got these two options and God has done both, so you can't complain. There's nothing else to do. If you ask, why is God appearing in this particular way? Why are planets and stars like this? I think then you are in the realm of science. Vedanta would say karma, there's a causality there. All right, we'll stop there. Yes. I'm just wondering, can a person actually be enlightened or is it a constant journey towards enlightenment? Oh, one can be enlightened. Yes, they are where people are enlightened. However, you're not entirely wrong. God is not, ex ultimate reality is not exhausted by one flash of enlightenment. So, once you discover that, Sri Ramakrishna, somebody in, in, the, um, you know, in front of Sri Ramakrishna said this, it's an endless journey, you know, was, and uh, one goes on and on. Sri Ramakrishna said, no. Where one finds peace, ultimately, that's the end of the journey. But for you, when you're enlightened, when you make a breakthrough, you touch God, see God, or Brahman, you realize that you are Brahman, that breakthrough is one and final. However, that does not mean that's the end of spiritual experience. Then you taste that divinity which you have discovered in a thousand different ways every day of your life for the rest of, of this particular existence. So the enlightened one can have various kinds of mystic experiences. For that enlightened one, every experience is a God experience. Kain Upanishad says, Pratibodha viditam matam amritatvam himindate. In every experience when you see that you see the same Brahman, then you attain to immortality. So in one sense, enlightenment is the end. You find peace. You know, that's it. The game of life is over. The riddle has been solved. The, I have attained. And you realize at that time it was always there. It, somehow I, didn't, I never saw it. It's an open secret. 
However, that's not the end of uh, it's not oh it's too bad boring now I I wish I hadn't finished so early. <laughs> no, uh, so game of life is over doesn't mean that it's it's in one sense it's begun. Swami Brahmananda says. Spiritual life starts after nirvikalpa samadhi. This is an extraordinary statement. We somehow, the way it has been put in yogic path, in the yogic path, nirvikalpa samadhi is said to be the final samadhi, the final meditative absorption. Swami Brahmananda says the spiritual life starts after that. What does that mean? It means after that it's real. It's no longer you're a seeker, you're found. You're no longer a believer. It's a fact for you, it's the most obvious fact for you, undeniable. So, uh, yeah, another little story let me share with you there here. There was um, one Swami um, from whom I learned Vedanta. His uh, name was Medha Chaitanya, then later on Damodar Ashram. He was one of the greatest Vedanta scholars of um, in, in Bengal at that time. When I started learning from him, he was already in his 90s and he, imagine a hundred year old teacher, <laughs> he kept, went on teaching up to almost the very end, he lived for 105. So he told me of a story, I asked him about his teachers and he studied under many great teachers including some of the greatest scholars in Sanskrit college in, in Calcutta at that time, um, Jogendranath Tarkovedanta Tirtho, profound scholar, encyclopedic scholar. So this monk, he told me, that this is this happened a long time ago, 60, 70 years ago. He said, I was going daily from the monastery. I would go daily to attend classes under this great pandit in Calcutta, then come across the river with a boat, the Ganga, come to the monastery in the evening. There was Gan Maharaj. Gan Maharaj was a disciple of Vivekananda. And Gan Maharaj was blind. Um, but he saw more than <laughs> other people. So he would sit and wait for me, this monk told me, so when, uh, don't get confused among all these characters. When I would go for classes with the great pundit, come back, and every day I had to repeat to him. He would sit there and say, who is it? I'd say, I've come, I've come back. What did the pundit say? And I, would, I have to give him a summary of what I learned that day. One day, I went to my master, that pundit, in Calcutta to attend classes, and I saw the pundit, he was, he was also very old, he was lying down reading a book. And I sort of asked him, this monk told me, you are a walking encyclopedia of anything to do with you know, religion and philosophy. You're still studying new things. And the pundit said, if I don't learn something new every day, I don't want to live. I must learn something new every day. So that inspired me a lot, this monk told me. That day when I crossed the river and came back in the evening to the monastery, Gyan Maharaj was sitting there. He said, who is it? I am this and this and so, I have come back from my classes. What did the Pandit say? Oh, the Pandit said, if I don't learn something new every day, then I don't want to live. And Gyan Maharaj said, that's good, that's the scholar's ideal. But remember, enlightenment is not new every day. It happens once and it's forever. So, that knowledge, the knowledge of the self, what, what I am, there is no second edition, third edition, updated. <laughs> but that doesn't mean it becomes stale. It's not something like, oh, I got enlightenment in 1965 and I have barely I sort of remember it. It was a great thing. It's not a memory. <laughs> you to yourself are not a memory. You are living ever fresh to yourself. What you are becomes clear to you. That's always living and fresh. That's, in fact, that's the only thing that's living and fresh. So answer, yes, there is an end, enlightenment, you attain unbroken, limitless peace. And, and no, there is no end to this infinite divine reality which you keep on experiencing. That's fine. Yeah. Yes, I'll come back to you. about um, absolute reality and things that it used to bring us to reality that are not 
that are unchanging uh, to show it's very simple but um, uh, things like morality or uh, or sort of absolute reality uh, and um, I, w- I was I was wondering like how, how about we describe in a little bit more detail like the the grammatical like system of reasoning that helps us uh, that, that guides us through understanding these things. All right. Don't complicate it unnecessarily. Let me let me put it very simple in one sentence. What we are all driving at, of course, this is Advaita Vedanta I'm talking about, non-dual Vedanta. Here, all that we are trying to drive at is, I am Brahman. This realization. What's your name? I am Shiv. Shiv. So, right now you feel straight away. Who are you? I'm Shiv. But by the way, you're very fortunately named. Shiva means the ultimate reality. So, uh, it means God, of course, Shiva. Uh, and this is the thing with Hindu names. They, they all mean the ultimate reality. <laughs> it's supposed to remind you of that. When you think of yourself or you call somebody else, you're talking. To. Now, I, I am Brahman, this realization. Right now, Whatever I can say, I have read this, I have understood that, but my feeling is, I am just this guy. And then the feeling will be, then the realization, indubitable, indubitable re- realization will be, I am limitless existence consciousness, or existence consciousness place. I am Brahman. This thing will flash. This is what we are all driving towards. And all this reading, understanding this and that, the metaphysics of it, the, the, the uh, ethics of it, the meditative practices, the devotional practices, God appearing as many things in the universe, these are all helpful. That's all. But don't get caught up in any of this. He's driving towards something very simple and very straight. Now, did you, you had a particular question about the reasoning behind it. Um, All right, I'll just mention two things and then we'll leave it at that. Broadly, the methodology followed in Vedanta is called Shruti Yukti Anubhuti. Shruti means these teachings, Upanishads, Gita, it's transmitted to you from our lineage of teachers, and they, they're like pointers. They point out something in your experience which you would not have noticed otherwise. Second, Yukti, reasoning. So these books are there, but everybody's reading them. What you take out of that depends upon the way you can interpret these texts and use reasoning. So reasoning, there's a whole science of it. Indian logic, Nyaya, how to make an inference and all of that. It's a vast, vast field, and very subtly developed. I think um, until the evolution of, until the development of modern symbolic logic and mathematical logic in 19th century, I would say 18th, 19th century, until that time, the most subtle and sophisticated system of logic that existed in the world uh, was uh, the Indian Nyaya system, which had been adopted by all the schools of Indian philosophy, including the Buddhists also. So, it was very subtle, very sophisticated, far more than the Greek um, uh, uh, Aristotelian logic. But of course, I mean, it's been exceeded in precision by modern mathematical logic and uh, symbolic logic. Um, and then the third pillar of that is Anubhuti. Shruti, Yukti, Anubhuti. Shruti is teachings, literally the, the Upanishads, that which is heard. Yukti, reasoning, logic. And there's a whole system of logic, just as I mentioned. And then Anubhuti. Anubhuti means experience, our own experience. It has to be grounded in experience. All three together, and this is the methodology that's developed. Okay, the lady here, and then you there. tend towards depression, whether because of genetics or trauma or circumstance, should such people um, 
be careful about meditation. Yeah. Reduce the intensity. Straight answer to your question is yes to both. Back off and reduce the intensity. That's my feeling. Um, remember, meditation is not the only spiritual practice. Devotion is a spiritual practice. A ritual is a spiritual practice. Service is a spiritual practice. Yeah. It's very useful for people who are by nature introverted, prone to depression and aloneness and loneliness and lack of meaning. Service immediately cures all of these problems. Yeah. It may be difficult. It may be difficult. <coughs> Such people don't want to interact with others. But the once you start, the taste it gives you. The immediate benefit and joy and the blessings which come into your life. Service is a very powerful uh, spiritual practice. And then this philosophical study, this inquiry, this is a very powerful spiritual practice. That's why the four yogas, jnana yoga, the yoga of, of knowledge, bhakti yoga, the yoga of love, um, then dhyana yoga, yoga of meditation, and uh, karma yoga, the yoga of work or service. What is the role of psychiatry in all of this? Uh, now there are two schools of thought in our order, in our tradition at least. There were some monks who said, no, you take all your problems to God. Don't depend upon um, a psychiatry, don't take drugs, don't... The other school of thought, which I subscribe to, there are also many great enlightened people, good monks in this order, in that school of thought, is that you take the help of uh, psychiatry, you take the, taking the help of uh, physical medicine anyway, you're going to a doctor if you have got a tummy ache, why, why won't you go to a, a psychiatrist if somebody's got depression or unhappiness or um, you know schizophrenia or what? It's a, an illness, it's now it can be shown it's also grounded in genetics, it's grounded in, in the brain, uh, nervous system. So if you're taking medicine to help you to digest or for your you know, diabetes or for your heart, then you can take medicine for the brain. There is, you know, earlier there was like a lot of, um, what would you call it, a, a kind of disrepute, a kind of uh, shame, shame, taboo associated with mental illness. No, it is just mostly gone now. I attended a conference, American Psychiatric Association, APA. They called a conference with faith leaders a few months ago in Washington, D.C. at their headquarters. And uh, they were the people who were strongly against any kind of religion or spirituality. They, to the extent of, for many, many decades, to the extent of saying that it's pathology. If you're religious, you are a nutcase. Now they're completely reversed. In the meeting itself, they were the leading members of the American, the most powerful body of psychiatrists, of the um, most, uh, you know, largest number of psychiatrists in the world here in the United States. And they said we have a shortfall of 30,000. Because they said we are now facing a mental health crisis in the country, exacerbated by a lack of mental health professionals and COVID. And that's true in other countries also. I know it's true in India also. And we need all the help we can get. And we notice whenever people have problems mentally, uh, they don't turn to a psychiatrist. They turn to the local pastor, to their local church leader. So their idea was two ways. What can we learn from you and what, and we can give you some kind of basic training. How do you recognize and deal with mental illness and help people when they come to you? Because they are saying, we have to be honest, we, can, we are seeing that people are coming to you, to the church leaders, to the priests and pastors, not to us at first. Um, so yes, so that's the second school of thought. Take at least counseling. Counseling is very useful, and it, it's a whole spectrum. From, uh, I mean, I can even tell you. Um, I will not tell the name. He was a past. He was the president of the American Psychiatric Association, and um, over lunch he took me aside because I was a monk. He took me aside and said, "Look, in my youth I went to Japan. I was a Buddhist monk for three years, and till today." Who's saying this? The president of the American Psychiatry Association. He said, till today, every day I meditate. So, yes. Take help. Meditation can, in some cases, um, aggravate symptoms of depression, unhappiness, um, psychosis. People are hallucinating. It's not a good idea to sit down and meditate at that time. You'll think, all right, I'm seeing God all the time. <laughs> No, don't do that. Yeah. There are other avenues of spiritual practice also. And so this is a big issue, but um, take help. 
I would say to everybody, a spiritual seeker, you're taking physi- help help from uh, medicine, from a doctor. If needed, be need be take help from a psychiatrist. There's no shame in it at all. Good question. Last question, yes. Om oh. I very much enjoy studying um, the Sonic Del and Yamaka. I, oh, okay. I watched your lecture on the uh, comparison between that and Bhakti Vedanta. I watch it frequently because I love the Chandra Kirti's explanation of that song. Something sort of um, was there was a little bit of a red flag. I'm hoping you can um, uh, elaborate a little bit more on the. And I've also heard that story of Ramakrishna talking about the hiss but don't bite. Because mm. um, I sort of was thinking. Wouldn't it be hard to do that? And I've had situations with work as well um, where I needed to hiss and even was told by my guru you need to be more aggressive and maybe even righteously become angry because they weren't paying and I needed to pay bills and such, but um, not sort of um, collapsing into that imaginary self, which is empty, which doesn't inherently exist. Um, It seems like it's so easy for me practically to sort of fall back into that as like a a fallback state, it's 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 easy to go back into the imaginary self, whereas um, it seems like that would be a hard thing to do. Can you, can you say like how... I'm going to set aside Advaita, I'm going to set, set aside Madhyamaka Buddhism, I'm going to go back many, many years ago to a uh, college professor um, who was teaching a course called Assertiveness Training. <laughs> I still remember the spectrum he drew. He said on one end of the spectrum is being aggressive. Screaming, shouting, demanding, bullying. And there are people like that. And there are behavior patterns like that. On the other end of the spectrum is being manipulative. Playing politics, talking and being bird, you know, talking dirty about somebody and behind their backs. Um, duplicity. That's the other end of the spectrum. But he says the right thing to do is in between. In between there is assertiveness. You're not aggressive. You're not mm, manipulative. It's the weak who are manipulative. Uh, it is even the aggressive also are in one sense weak actually. To be assertive you need to be strong. So you have a right to say what you want to say. But the other person also has a right to say no. You should be fearless in saying what you want to say but also strong in accepting what the other person has to say. Uh, so it's easier said than done. I remember we, we as kids, we as students, we used to call the course how to be rude. <laughs> Assertiveness training. <laughs> How to be rude. <laughs> All right, I said that was the last question, but yes. Uh, as you have told, or we know that uh, nothing in this world happens without the will of the God, hmm. then why there is this phenomenon of good karma or bad karma, and how are we as individuals able to do any wrong, willing, or any. Oh, that's a big question. The question of evil. Why is there evil if everything is the will of God? The straight answer to that, even then, we must be hard-headed and logical. The straight answer is that even what we see as evil is in some way willed by God. Does it make us stronger? It's like, I'm sure that when we first went to school, our parents, mom forced us, dragged us to pre-kindergarten or whatever, which we must have asked the same question. Why is there so much evil in this world? Why am I being... <laughs> Dragged off to school, uh, but ultimately we see it was for our, it's really for our own good. So there are many answers. I can give you twenty-four actually, twenty-four answers. If you look at, uh, there's a book, there's a book, uh, Arthur Herman, the problem of evil in Indian thought. What are the answers you get in Hinduism, Buddhism? But he collects answers from all religions of the world and different philosophers of the world, and he has a list of twenty-four. <laughs> So, yes, so the multiple answers are possible. One answer I just gave you, that maybe it's not evil. Maybe both what we see, good and evil, are pushing us along in spiritual life. If things were perfectly fine here, then we wouldn't want anything else. We would want to stay here. Be worldly. Often, people make spiritual progress in suffering, rather than in pleasure and in a fine life. They don't grow. Have you noticed? It's a well-known phenomenon across the world. Children of rich parents. They don't do too well. Why? They should do well. They've got all privilege. They've got all opportunities. 
that's what the parents ensure that our kids will ha- have a better life than we had but then it doesn't work out that way why so maybe some amount of challenge toughness is uh, shock is necessary that's not a complete answer the places there there's such terrible suffering that it's not leading to anybody's growth it's just just suffering and ends in death maybe so how do you explain that so there are m- many theories this is one theory i g- gave you then there is the karma theory then there is the, how would the karma theory work one thing the karma theory does to answer your question is karma theory takes the blame away from god mm-hmm. if god's will is good god's will is good but god has also given us freedom and we exercise the freedom in this way through karma and we end up with this world this very interestingly the karma theory is this is the conclusion the karma theory in hinduism buddhism jainism sikhism but this is also the conclusion the official doctrine of the catholic church that evil is a product of um god's giving us free will and god is perfect but given us free will and we have created this world for ourselves even here there are many objections but it's all, almost 9 o'clock <laughs> om shanti 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 hari hi om tat sat shri ram krishna rupa namastu